And if you've done everything right, you should now start getting some output on your screen, and it's going to spit you out not actually at this screen. It's going to spit you out at a blue background screen here in a second. So you should get spit out at a screen like this uh, as soon as you're done powering yeah. up. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like all the very very easy. It's not really capable of using that. I didn't know that either. I didn't know that either. Yeah. I didn't know that either. 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 So this is what we call the Raspberry Pi configuration screen. You can actually launch this at any time, but it gets launched the first time you ever boot a Raspberry Pi. So if you boot a Raspberry Pi with a fresh SD card, uh, you're always going to get this screen first. There's a handful of things we need to change here. The most important one being the Raspberry Pi is a British device. So by default, all of the locale and keyboard settings are for Great Britain, which if you've never looked at a British keyboard, has different symbols associated with each number key. So if you're like touch typing like I do and you go to use a British keyboard, all of a sudden every symbol and everything you type is suddenly wrong. Uh, and you prefer to switch it to a nice US keyboard like you're used to using. Um, so the other big thing we need to do is, and this is actually, we'll just go through these in order. It doesn't really matter what order you do these things in, but I'll do from top down. So when I formatted these SD cards, it basically assumes that your SD card's only two gigabytes big. So you all have eight gigabyte cards, but right now it's only using two gigabytes on them. So this first option, expand root FS, basically takes that initial SD card image and expands it to fill up whatever size of SD card you happen to have. So go ahead and run that. Just scroll down. Uh, there's obviously no mouse, but use the keyboard to keyboard down and hit enter. It should tell you something like this when it's done, and then you can hit OK. Um, the overscan settings we're going to skip. That's basically if you're in a situation where it's like running off the sides of your screen or it's not appropriately sized to the screen, overscan is where you adjust the screen size, but that shouldn't be an issue for any of you. We are going to want to configure the keyboard layout. So if we go down to that and hit enter, it's going to take a second to load up the keyboard thing. Ah, cool. So there's a couple of options we're going to want to set here. Um, the first one doesn't actually matter that much. Uh, by default, it's set on, I think, one down from here, 105. This is what it's set on by default. If you go to the non-international version, that's probably a little bit closer. I didn't actually look up exactly what keyboards these are, but the generic 104 key PC should work pretty much across the board. So if you select that and hit enter. The next page is where you actually need to make a change. Now, I've already made this change, so my screen looks different, but your guys is probably all say UK here right now. So what you need to do is scroll down to other, find the option that says English US, select it, and then you just want the default top option unless you happen to be using a Dvorak keyboard because you're really cool. Um, but you're going to want the top option if you want a regular QWERTY keyboard. So go ahead and select the top option. It's going to take you through a couple of things. You can basically just stick with the defaults on all of these. So those are both fine. This one last one, the default's going to be no. Uh, I prefer mine on yes. This is just when you're using the desktop, do you want to be able to hit control alt backspace to log out quickly? I like being able to do that. If you want to do that, select yes. If you don't, select no. It's really of no consequence. It's personal preference. So when you hit that, it's going to pause for a second. It's going to go down here and basically set up your new keyboard for you, and then it should spit us back to the config screen when it's done. People still with me? Feel free to shout out questions or raise your hand if I do anything that doesn't make sense. Is there an option for control for caps lock? Uh, there probably is, but if it didn't show it to you in that screen, it's probably a config file somewhere. I mean, it's however you would, it's Linux. So however you would normally do it, you can probably work here. Um, so you guys don't have to do this tonight. By default, the username and password on that operating system that we installed, the username is pi and the password is raspberry, all lowercase. Um, obviously, it's never a good idea to keep a default username and password on a device that you're actually going to be using on the internet. So 
For the purposes of the one hour we're using them tonight, it doesn't really matter. If you want to change the password, go for it. I'm going to reflash all these SD cards before next week's class anyway, so I don't care what you change it to. If you're lazy and don't want to change it now, that's fine. But if this were your own Raspberry Pi, and if you were actually going to go out and use this, you would absolutely want to change the password right now, um, especially if you're connecting it to the internet. Because, uh, you know, as soon as it's connected to the internet, if it has a default username and password, people know what a Raspberry Pi looks like on the internet. They're always going to try logging in with the default username and password first. So, if you want to stay in control of your own Raspberry Pi, change your password. Um, we do want to change the locale, kind of the same reason we wanted to change the keyboard. So, this sets up the default language, default currency, default all of that kind of stuff um, for all the programs on your machine. By default, it's going to be Great Britain. So, you can't, don't actually press enter on this screen. This allows you, it's a multi uh, checkbox selection. So you press space bar to either select or unselect. So right now there should be English UK selected or English Great Britain. So one of these is selected right now. You can actually unselect it by going down to it and hitting space bar. But then you want to select the US option. So if you go down a little bit further, select the UTF-8 option. So scroll down hit the space bar so you get the little asterisk. And when you have the asterisk here and not in the UK, then you can hit OK. You can actually have asterisks in both places. It doesn't hurt it. But uh, it saves you a little bit of memory if you minimize how many of these you have selected. So the only one you need is the US UTF one. Hit spacebar to select it, and then hit Enter. If you just hit Enter without hitting spacebar first, it won't actually select it. So if you did the last step correctly, one of your options on this screen should be ENUS. Select that as the default, and then hit Enter. And now it's going to pause for a second while it goes and builds this. So all of this stuff you only have to do once the first time you boot the Pi. I mean, you can do it again if you want to change it, but these settings will all be persistent uh, when we go to reboot the Pi from this point forward. So this is the first time you're using a new SD card. So let's go ahead and set up our time zone correctly. So if you go down to change time zone, it should fire up the time zone menu here. We are in America. I assume you knew that. Uh, the time zones are done by nearest major city. So ours is Denver. So if you just scroll down to Denver and select Denver, that'll get you mountain time. This memory split option is uh, one of those tweaks that's kind of unique to the Raspberry Pi. So. Like I said, that main chip on the Raspberry Pi actually has two components in it. It has your CPU, so your main processor that you use most of the time, and then it has the GPU, so your graphics processor. Um, GPUs are good for a different set of tasks than CPUs are. Uh, they're not just for graphics. You can use them to do general purpose computation, but they tend to be good for massively parallel type computation, not things that you have to do one step after another. Things you can do a lot of things at the same time. But the amount of memory in your Raspberry Pi is fixed. You only have on a Model B half a gig. So you have to decide how much of that memory you want to dedicate to the GPU and how much you want to dedicate to the CPU. Uh, and that's what this memory split controls. So if you're a normal user and you're not really messing with the GPU, you want most of your memory going to the CPU because that's just going to increase your performance. If you're doing a lot of video work or if you're actually going to use the GPU to do something GPU intensive, you would then allocate more memory to the GPU. So if you select this, you basically control this split by choosing how much the GPU gets and then the CPU gets everything else. So we have half a gig, which is 512 megabytes. So we can take up to half of our memory and give it to the GPU uh, or some fraction of it. The default of 64 is fine uh, for our purposes. We could really probably even turn it down because we're not doing anything really memory intensive. But this is one of those trade-offs between, depending upon your application, if you're using a lot of GPU, give it more memory. If you're not using it at all, if you're just using the CLI, or you're not even ever plugging in the graphics, you're just using this out in the field connected to some sensors, you would turn this down to 16 to give you as much memory for the CPU as possible. So the default's fine. Changing it doesn't break anything. It's just, you know, it's a performance tweak. If you uh, aren't using a monitor, could you turn it to zero? You can never turn it to zero because the GPU still has to boot. It's, it's a core component, so it, you can't boot it without a GPU. So 16 is the lowest you can do. Um, the Raspberry Pi actually overclocks pretty effectively. The caveat being, don't go do this right now because this is luck of the draw, right? You may get a Raspberry Pi that just so happens to have a chip that's a little bit above spec and you can overclock it and it'll work just fine. You may get a Raspberry Pi that as soon as you go to overclock, it won't boot up anymore. Um, you're probably not going to actually break your Raspberry Pi. Worst case, you have to 
take your SD card, build a new version that has the overclocking turned off and start over again. Um, but you can tend to squeeze a little bit of extra performance out of the Raspberry Pi by making its processor work a little bit faster than it was designed for. Um, don't mess with this on these because, you know, what's the point, right? You're going to be using it for the next half hour of your life and you're more likely to screw it up. But if you had your own Raspberry Pi, what you would do is you would probably go through these step by step and you'd want to, like, use it for a little while on each setting to make sure it was working okay. Um, if you can get it all the way up to this speed and have it still be working fine, it doesn't freeze, it doesn't do anything like that, then great. You've just increased your performance by 30 some odd percent. Um, if you get to one of these settings and it starts to misbehave, you notice freezing, you notice glitches on the screen, you generally want to back it off one and then keep it there. So you can overclock the Raspberry Pi, they work pretty well. I don't even think it violates the warranty, maybe because I don't even know if they have a warranty. But um, <laughs> it's, it's not super risky, it's pretty safe kind of overclocking, which is why you know they give you an easy, anyone can use it menu to deal with it. If this were something that would actually break your Raspberry Pi, they wouldn't make it this easy for you to do. But while it won't necessarily break your Raspberry Pi, it might break your SD, I mean, it might ruin your image. You might have to go reinstall if you go too fast and it doesn't work and it won't reboot, so on and so forth. So if you want to squeeze all the performance possible out of the Raspberry Pi, you can overclock it. We're not going to mess with it, but you know, it's an option. If you hit escape, it'll just cancel out. So SSH is the standard protocol for connecting to a thing remotely. Um, we're going to go ahead and turn SSH on, so this will allow us to remote into our Raspberry Pis. So if you go to SSH and select Enable, and then hit enter. Um, this is the point where now you really hope you've changed your password because we've just made it so that other people can log into our Raspberry Pi from the internet. And if you haven't changed your password, that's trivial. Um, don't worry about it in here. You're sitting on the campus network, so there's some additional protection between us and anyone else. Uh, but this is what you would want to turn on if you didn't want to use your Raspberry Pi with a monitor or something after this point. You can actually turn this on without ever booting the Raspberry Pi. If after you first create the SD card, you can open up the SD card and this menu is just writing text to configuration files. Linux is all about plain text configuration files. There's no registry or anything like in Windows. There's just a bunch of files and the files have settings in them. Um, so you could always go into the file and turn on SSH manually if you wanted to have a Raspberry Pi that you could just SSH into without ever having it connected to a monitor at all, even the first time you boot it. But as soon as this is turned on, the monitor just becomes a convenience factor. We could actually connect to this from your laptop, and we'll go through that here in a little bit. Boot behavior basically controls whether or not it boots a desktop environment. So the desktop environment is what you're used to seeing on a computer, right? That's where you can use your mouse, it's where you have icons, it's where you have a GUI interface, or whether or not you boot directly to a terminal. Um, go ahead and turn this to no, just because then I can teach you how to start a desktop environment if you do get booted to a terminal, which happens sometimes. Um, but if you were just going to use this to like click around all the time, then keeping this at yes is something you might want to do. And finally, don't run this because it'll take a while, but uh, this would go ahead and if you're connected to the internet, this would upgrade everything on your Raspberry Pi. So that OS image we installed only gets updated every few months. There's other updates that happen in between. So you can pull those other updates from the internet. It's always a good idea to make sure anything connected to the internet is as up to date as possible because there's security bugs and stuff that get fixed with these updates. Um, we're not going to worry about it right now just because you can always do it later and because it takes about half an hour on most of these pies to do the update. So when this is all done, go ahead and go down to finish. It's going to ask if you want to reboot. Go ahead and hit yes. And now it should boot us up to a prompt. exactly how long it takes to boot. The numbers on the left is the how many seconds since it started the boot process. So Oh, it's just sync. On Linux. Yeah, yeah, it's just like that. I mean, you need to do that. Okay. Yeah. And that'll block, the sync will block until it breaks up into the disk. So as soon as sync returns, it's safe. Is that really the load? Yeah. 
Okay, so when this is done booting, you guys should be at a little login prompt. If you, like I said, the default user is Pi, and the default password's Raspberry, unless you change the default password, and then it's whatever you changed it to. And if you changed it and already forgot it, then you probably shouldn't have changed it. There's not a lot I can do about that. I mean, there are things you could do about that. We open it up on another machine, but we don't have time to deal with it right now. Um, so as soon as that gets booted, I think I broke mine. Um, so as soon as that gets booted, you'll be looking at a prompt. I'm not going to wait for mine to catch up. Um, but on that prompt, it's just a regular Linux prompt. So you could start running if you're used to working on a Linux command line. I mean, you can use this Linux command line. You can do everything you would want to do right now. Um, you actually have multiple terminals by default on Linux. So if you do control alt followed by an F key, you can switch, you'll, you'll get other login prompts. So uh, up to seven. So this I think is the F1. So if you like control alt F2, it should open up another prompt. Um, and now you can log in. So if you like working in multiple windows, this is actually a pretty usable environment. To get back to where you were, you do control alt F1. And you can do that up to F7. Um, but the Raspberry Pi does have a desktop environment. I'm going to forcefully reboot mine because I don't know what I did to it. Okay. 